Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Eric Feldman. I'm the Associate Director of FIU in Washington, D.C., and we are gathered this afternoon to discuss the very important topic of voting rights and election security as part of our Talent Lab Impact Series. For those of you who might be logging on to an FIU in D.C. program for the first time or need a refresher on who we are, we represent the university here in the nation's capital, and uh, we have a few pillars of our operations. On the solution side, we advocate at the federal level for funding and federal partnerships for our preeminent research areas. We do our idea exchange. These are uh, events that bring together in Washington, D.C., think tank experts, federal officials, FIU researchers, and others to discuss um, uh, solutions to issues that face not only South Florida in the world. And the Talent Lab, that's what you're experiencing today where we provide professional development to our students and alumni. I'll we'll talk a little bit more about that. To highlight quickly a few FIU programs that our DC team supports and advocates for that relate to cybersecurity, which has some relation to today's topic, though cybersecurity is only one aspect of elections. Our College of Com Engineering and Computing is home to the nation's first bachelor's degree in the Internet of Things, or IoT. The NSF and DHS funded Cyber, Cyber Corps Cybersecurity Scholarship Program, as well as some pioneering energy infrastructure security research. On the policy side, our Gordon Institute for Public Policy hosts executive education programs on cyber policy. They actually have a session enrolling now. You can check that out at gordoninstitute.fiu.edu. The Talent Lab, which is the, the part of our operations that, that I manage and this event is part of, consists of fly-in seminars to DC on different topics, internships, and our Hamilton Scholars Semester Academic Program, as well as our Impact Series of events, which you are uh, part of today. To make sure you know of a few other things uh, coming up soon, internship deadlines, as well as events. Every Thursday morning, our uh, partners at Florida House in Washington, D.C. host a breakfast session with a member of Congress in Florida. They have Ted Deutsch this Thursday morning at 8 o'clock. I'll paste this into the chat. You can email RSVP at Florida House, D.C. if you would like to join that conversation with, with Congressman Deutsch. Uh, we also have uh, one of our South Florida members of Congress, Debbie Washerman Schultz. Her internship deadline is coming up in just about a week or so, and a great internship program at the Charles Koch Institute is accepting uh, internship applications th through the rest of this month. And uh, they partner with many different think tanks on many different fo focuses to uh, place their interns uh, to work out. I'll paste those links both in the chat. I wanted to mention them here. Uh, feel free to go ahead. Some of you are already saying hello in the chat. We appreciate that engagement to introduce yourself in the chat. Tell us if you have uh, a relationship to FIU and what interested you about this topic. And feel free to comment in the chat throughout the, throughout the program, anything that's on your mind. As far as questions go, what we're going to do is you can put the questions into the chat. They might get asked one or two ways. Our, our moderator uh, will, will call on you to ask your question via video after we've seen it in the chat. Um, and in the occasion that there might be uh, a few questions that are similar in nature for uh, the sake of time, we might combine them into one question and, and ask them for you. So we encourage your questions and comments throughout the chat. It's my pleasure to introduce our esteemed uh, panel today. Um, and I'm gonna start with Mirna Perez. She's the director of the Voting Rights and Elections Program at the Brennan Center for Justice, which is at the NYU uh, School of Law. She leads the program's research, advocacy, and litigation work nationwide. Her work has been featured in media outlets across the country, including the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and MSNBC. She has testified before Congress and several state legislatures related to voting rights. Prior to Brendan Center, she was a civil rights fellow at a law firm here in DC, and she previously served as chair as the, of the Election Law Committee of the New York City Bar Association. Perez is the recipient of several awards, including the Puerto Rican Bar Association Award for Excellence in Academia and the New Jersey League of Women uh, Voters Making Democracy Work Award. And she was named one of 2014 50 Hispanic Influentials by Hispanic Business. She graduated from and is a lecturer at Columbia Law School. Next up on our panel is our very own FIU alumna, Danielle Caputo. Danielle joined Issue One in January 2019, where part of her work includes uh, that organization's efforts to make sure that states and localities have the funding they need to hold safe, secure, and fair elections. Prior to Issue One, Danielle worked at the Senate Judiciary Committee 
And as a law student, she interned on the Federal Election Commission, Citizens for Responsibility and Ethics in Washington and Common Cause. She has her bachelor's from none other than Florida International University in Political Science and International Relations, uh, an MPP from the George Washington University, and her JD also from the George Washington University. Serving as a moderator for this conversation today is a good, uh, another good friend of FIU, Ian Wallace. Ian is uh, the senior fellow at the German Marshall Fund's uh, Digital Innovation and Democracy Initiative. He is a cyber and tech policy expert and is acting chair of the Strategy and Policy Working Group of the Global Forum on Cyber Expertise. He is a regular speaker on tech and policy issues, including in testimony to Congress and has taught a course on tech policy here at FIU. Prior to GMF, he spent five years directing the Cybersecurity Initiative at New America. His work there covered international cyber capacity building, military cyber and data governance, he helped establish the DigiChina blog in 2017, which translate, analyzes, and open sources digital economy material from China. Earlier in his career, he was a senior British Ministry of Defense civil servant, including serving as defense policy and nuclear counselor at the British Embassy here in Washington, DC. He's a graduate of Oxford University. I'm going to paste in the chat some of the uh, uh, the links that I mentioned earlier for internships and upcoming events. I also want to mention that uh, we were going to have uh, a representative uh, from the election uh, law reform program at the Heritage uh, Foundation uh, join us today. He unfortunately was not able to attend the last moment, but I'm going to include along with the links in the chat, the links to Heritage Foundation's election integrity page where our uh, expected panelist Hans has written uh, many pieces about election security and the potential impacts of mail-in voting and, and, uh, and, uh, and other issues on election security. And I'd also like to thank um, another one of our alumni in the chat for being here, Helena Richardson, who manages the uh, Young Leaders uh, Internship Program at the Heritage uh, Foundation. We always appreciate their uh, participation in our events and programs. Uh, so Ian, I'm gonna turn it over to you. And I'm also gonna ask, since uh, you're gonna be asking the questions more than answering them, if you'd like to take the first minute or so to tell us a little bit about what GMF is up to in terms of digital innovation and democracy, uh, we'd love to hear that and then uh, get into this conversation. Yeah, thank you very much, Eric. Um, uh, GMF, German Marshall Fund, is a think tank uh, based here in Washington, DC, but we also have offices uh, in five capitals across Europe, uh, in Brussels, uh, Paris, Berlin, uh, Warsaw, and Budapest. And uh, the Digital Innovation uh, and Democracy Initiative is a new program uh, at GMF focused on the sort of impact that um, sort of digital transformation is, is having uh, on, on the economy and indeed on democracy. Um, and operating, if you like, at the, the intersection between, between economics and uh, national security. Um, we, we haven't focused specifically yet, at least, uh, on uh, election security, uh, but clearly that is a, a very important part of the, the story of how um, digital, uh, in at least one part of the story, uh, of how um, digital uh, innovation is, is having its impact on democracy. And, that, that obviously happens in, in multiple different ways, as I'm sure we'll at least touch on as we, we go forward. But uh, should, we, should we get started, Eric? Yeah, sounds great. Fantastic. Um, well, welcome to everybody. Um, it's very exciting for me to be uh, uh, working with uh, the FIU and DC team. Um, and I think whatever your politics, I think we can all agree that 2020 is gonna be a, a landmark election. Uh, and uh, for anyone of you who, who follow the news, um, I suspect you already feel a little bit more knowledgeable about how elections work and how, how they may go wrong uh, than you probably did a few months ago. But um, as I think we'll, we'll discover, this is a topic that's more often discussed than really understood. And, and there is a, a, a plenty of um, rich uh, detail uh, that, that goes into uh, running and managing elections uh, and therefore uh, um, how um, uh, what efforts need to be put into making sure that those elections work in the, the ways that, that support democracy. 
Um, I um, just will give you a few thoughts on format before we uh, get, get to the speakers. Um, I'm going to ask some questions for uh, Mirda and uh, Danielle to sort of uh, describe what they do and uh, give us some uh, information uh, about how elections work. Then we're going to go into a little bit of a moderated discussion. I'm going to sort of tease out some of the issues and pick up some of the, the themes that we may have seen in the uh, news and elsewhere. Uh, and then for the last 20 minutes or so, we're going to turn it over to questions from you. Eric's going to help me pull those together from the chat, but uh, we'll try and get as many people uh, on screen to ask those questions as possible. But as we're going forward, if you do have a question, feel free to stick it in the chat and we'll, we'll, we'll hopefully get to you uh, at the end. Um, so um, uh, let's, let's get cracking. Um, Mira, um, if um, uh, you could begin just by giving us a sense of um, what, we, what election um, uh, organizers need to do to get ready for elections. Thank you so much. Bienvenidos, welcome. I'm Mirna Perez. I am the director of the Voting Rights and Elections Program at the Brennan Center. I'm hoping to be able to have some time at the end to tell you more about the Brennan Center because something that I think is gonna be highly relevant to a lot of people is that we hire undergrads. <laughs> um, we hire them during the term, we hire them upon graduation. So I'm hoping to be able to tell you about some of those opportunities. But I wanna start off by saying that much of right now has been about how we are going to leave no voter behind um, in the midst of this global, un, like once in a lifetime pandemic. What COVID did, in my opinion, was lay bare the weaknesses and cracks in our system. And it's important that we address and resolve these because right now it's COVID, but in other years we could have uh, weather related uh, calamities or foreign cyber criminals could cripple our infrastructure. And our elections are too important to not have some resiliency uh, built in to being able to withstand whatever crisis the moment throws at us. Um, elections are complicated because they're dynamic and they are part of an ecosystem. So doing more here will have an impact here. Um, but we have put our advocacy into uh, a few buckets. Um, the first is protecting our polling places. Um, we already know that voters have different experiences when they go to the polls. The Brennan Center recently issued a report where we demonstrated that if you are of color, you are more likely to wait longer in line. Um, we've done uh, studies in the past that have shown that in places where there were really long lines um, that were largely of color, we saw disparities in the amount of resources like polling places and poll workers and machines that uh, communities got. And um, recently in our study, we demonstrated that communities with changing demographics had fewer resources. And by that, I mean, if your jurisdiction was one that was getting less white and more poor, you had fewer uh, per person voting places, uh, voting resources than if you were stable. Now, poll, uh, COVID has made all of this worse because we have fewer polling locations, uh, fewer people want to be poll workers, money that used to get diver, uh, designed to try and help secure our election technology is being diverted. Um, and, uh, we're in a place where there are members of our community that are going to want to vote in person for a whole bunch of reasons. Um, sometimes people have really bad mail service. Sometimes uh, people have a language or uh, limitation that they want translation services that happen at the polls. People with physical or visual impairments may want um, the kind of assisted technology that happens at the polling places. So we need to be in a place where we make sure that every community member that is going to uh, need to vote in person has this opportunity for doing so safely. Um, what can you guys do? You guys can volunteer to be poll workers in many states. Um, you'll need to look up what your state rule is. There are guides that help you do that. But many, many election workers would love to hear that young, healthy people in your age brackets um, are interested in being polling uh, poll workers because much of the community that serves as poll workers are in a high risk category. So bucket number two, early voting. 
Um, we have seen cutbacks to early voting um, over the last decade um, be, become weaponized. Um, if, the, if, if Hans was here, he would argue that uh, there were causes for this. I would take the position that when you cut back on early voting, um, you limit people's flexibility and that you limit people's options to being able to vote. But it's not just a matter of convenience when we're talking about a global pandemic. We actually need more times for people to vote so that we can smooth out the congestion. Because in most times, disenfranchisement is, uh, I'm sorry, long lines are disenfranchising or deterring. Um, they could actually be deadly in the time of pandemic if we don't have enough people spread out so that we can have social, uh, enough social distancing. So Pennsylvania and Virginia have passed laws that would be creating early voting. Utah canceled some of that for their June primary. So one of the things that you guys can do is get active in your community and protect your early voting opportunities if you have them and be part of the solution to try and find early voting sites. The third bucket of advocacy is universal access to vote by mail. Now, I want to be clear, that's not the same thing as requiring everybody to vote by mail. That is, means giving people the option to vote safely from their home so that they don't have to go outside and don't have to risk exposure to, a vi uh, don't have to, risk exposure to the coronavirus. Um, and that they also don't infect other people, right? They don't, in fact, they don't get other people exposed. Um, 30 states uh, allow people to vote uh, without any sort of excuse, but there are a bunch of states that still do. Um, the rules around the country have been changing on this, but some states are being very, very resistant to expanding access and allowing uh, everybody to have the option to vote by mail in this particular um, in this particular election. And one of the things is because many of you guys are working in DC for Congress members is that I don't believe that we need to solve the how much vote by mail access do we need to have forevermore. I think it's pretty easy to say. Right now, when in the middle of a global pandemic where we need people to be uh, staying away from polling places as much as possible, we need universal access to vote by mail. We can then learn from it, we can look at the data, and then we can decide what we want to do in 2021 going forward, right? But like right now, we need universal access to vote by mail. There's certainly some challenges. Like we know that um, in many places, there's a disparity in who uses vote by mail. It is often used by whiter voters or older voters, um, which uh, is something that we want to make more of the communities using because people who are dying from COVID are more largely uh, people of color. So we want to uh, do whatever education and access improvement to make sure that every community has equal opportunity um, and starts feeling comfortable with vote by mail. Um, the fourth bucket is voter registration. Um, we're in the middle of the summer. Um, many of you under normal circumstances would be out with brightly colored t-shirts, going to festivals, trying to register your fellow uh, unregistered uh, students and passerbys, but you can't do that because of social distancing requirements. And while most of the country uh, registers to vote by going into motor vehicles offices, many states up until very recently had closed their voter vehicle offices, which means people weren't getting registered there. So we have some states where there are more people being purged from the rolls and there are being added because of the diminishment in voter registration opportunities. This is really bad for our democracy because we're gonna have a closed loop. We have people turning 18 every day. We have people becoming naturalized every day. And if we don't design our system such that those folks can be brought into our community, we're going to be missing out on their expertise and on their judgment. And then the last bucket of advocacy is what we call voter education and, and manipulation. Um, there are two big problems we're having right now. One, the laws are changing at a time where people do not have the emotional or time resources to, to keep track of all of the rules and what the policies are and what they're supposed to be doing. And then we have active trolls, cyber criminals, jerks, trying to spread misinformation or disinformation. What's the difference? Misinformation is when somebody uh, purposely makes a mistake. Uh, I'm sorry, misinformation is when someone accidentally makes a mistake, but it is disenfranchising. And disinformation is when somebody's affirmatively trying to do so. Um, you guys may be surprised to hear that earlier uh, in the year, DC sent out wrong information about when their primaries were. Um, because somebody made a mistake. Um, and so uh, we need to make sure that there's enough 
good, accurate information out there to both combat the misinformation and the disinformation, and to make sure that voters actually know what the policies are. They know when they're supposed to turn out to vote. They know what the rules are. Um, I'm, I'm going to end here now, but I'm hoping that part of the discussion centers around how we make hard choices in a world where we cannot get everything we want. I think what public policy is and what you guys are largely doing through your internships is trying to figure out how you strike a bunch of balances when you cannot optimize every good. And I think at this particular moment in time, it is clear that we need voters to have as many options as possible to casting a ballot because our lives are complicated and because the disturbances and disruptions that are caused by the coronavirus are affecting us differently. But our country is better when we're all participating. And I hope that you guys will agree and join me in making sure that no voter is left behind uh, this November. Mita, that's a fantastic start. And um, there are so many themes that we could return to there. And uh, uh, we absolutely, uh, I should say up front, uh, intend to come back to uh, how uh, various students can get involved and, and, and learn a little bit more about what the Brennan Center does, uh, because that's an important part about what this is, this is all about. Um, but before that, I'm going to come to Danielle. And uh, uh, I specifically want to ask you about the resources that are required to, to, to run elections. As someone who grew up outside the US and became a citizen a few years ago, it is, it's still remarkable to me just how decentralized uh, the, the, the running of elections is. And, and that doesn't happen you know, without the resources to, to make it work, uh, certainly if we want the, the elections to run um, safely and securely and fairly. So, so Danielle, can you just tell us a little bit about the work that your organization does to, to, to ensure that that happens and, and how in 2020 uh, you're, you're hoping that uh, that works out? Sure. So issue one to start, we, we had never really entered into the voting arena. We had very much been focused on uh, money and politics and kind of good government ethics issues, but we started seeing a real need first with um, disinformation in the 2016 and 2018 elections, moving into um, election security. And from there, you know, COVID happened and we realized that there's really a need for states and localities, especially to uh, receive funding to basically meet the demands, um, the unique demands that are basically occurring as a result of voting in the middle of a global pandemic. And so, um, as you mentioned, we have a very decentralized system for, um, elections in the United States. And as a result, pretty much most of the election decisions as far as buying equipment and hiring poll workers and things of that nature come from um, either states or localities, which could be counties or um, depending on how states do it. Um, sometimes specific cities do certain things. So um, basically what we have been trying to do is highlight to Congress who does oftentimes grant money to the states um, in order to buy the things that they need to um, have their elections happen and occur. Um, basically, they don't have enough money. Right now we're in the middle of a pandemic. There's a recession happening at the same time. They're already dealing with a lot of additional costs um, going into just COVID-19 and dealing with that. And now on top of that, they have the issue of how are we going to buy the additional supplies and things that we need. So. Generally speaking, you already have poll workers, you need to rent, you know, locations in order for voting, um, you need to buy the actual election equipment. And now on top of that, you know, most poll workers are uh, 60 or older. And so they're at the highest risk to contract COVID-19. So you have a, a huge decline in uh, poll workers who are actually willing to go be at the polls. And so um, now you need to recruit younger people who may be less affected. Um, you need to make sure that poll workers have protective equipment. Um, you have to make sure that states are gonna have um, an increase of absentee ballot requests, make sure that they're able to purchase the absentee ballots and print them out and send them in a timely fashion, which we have seen has not always been the case in the primaries. So um, that's pretty much issue one's main focus currently has been we are in an emergency, states need funding now because they have to be able to procure all of those things in time for the election to happen to make sure that our elections are safe and secure. Um, because too, a lot of states, you know, are still requiring people to 
vote in person. And so you want to make sure that people who either have to vote in person or are choosing to vote in person can be as protected and safe as possible. Um, all 50 states and territories have some sort of absentee ballot available to their um, population, to their electorate. And so, you know, those states that will be printing uh, absentee ballots are going to need to most likely print additional ones too. And we want to make sure that we don't see an increase in disenfranchisement just because of COVID-19. So um, that's been our main focus is mainly getting that funding. There was $400 million in the CARES Act that went to the states, but all of that money has already been spent. And for most of the states, it's only, you know, like 10% of what they need. So for example, in Georgia, uh, they received about $10 million from the 400 million. But in order to actually have safe and secure elections uh, going into the general election, they actually need um, anywhere between 100 to 100 and like $25 million. So obviously the $10 million is not going to cut it for, for that. And that's happening in multiple states and not just in Georgia, but pretty much everywhere. So that's our focus um, right now. Due to the pandemic, uh, we also realize as an organization that um, on average, 40, 45% of the public who are eligible to vote do not vote. And that is a crisis also that needs to be addressed. Um, our goal currently is to deal with the, you know, burning fire right now, that is the 2020 elections and COVID-19, um, and then see what we do from there to figure out the problem of um, people either not being able to vote or just not voting. Thank you. That, that is a great summary, again, of, of, of what you're up to and, and some of the issues that we're dealing with. And that, that last piece uh, about people not voting is a, is a good hook uh, for me to come back to Meda to, to ask about one of the sort of more troubling aspects that, that we hear about, and, uh, voter suppression and sort of active attempts to, to prevent people from uh, going to the polls. You, you mentioned some of this in your initial comments, Meda, but can you just say a little bit more about what the Brennan Center is doing to, to counter that and, and perhaps to sort of piggyback off what Danielle was saying, also to encourage other people who are, um, may not be uh, uh, going to the polls in a, as much as they might. Yeah, so I, I think we need to start basically in 2010, where after 2008, we saw uh, a bunch of legislatures uh, change uh, political affiliation. And then we saw a wave of legislation that would put barriers in front of the ballot box um, be introduced coast to coast. Um, uh, many of these laws uh, were challenged uh, via court, and some of them were blunted. Uh, some of them went into effect. Um, but I think that was a real turning point for the country because there had been a lot of bipartisan support for the idea that voting should be free, fair, and accessible. And that, I think, is a very tangible time where it there's an academic ability to prove that something changed, that something turned. And what did these legislation, what did this legislation look about? like? Some of it was cut back to early voting. Some of it was uh, demanding photo identification that between eight and 12% of Americans don't have. Some of it was trying to cut back on election day uh, registration opportunities. Some of it was trying to make it harder for groups to go out and register other voters. Different states saw different flavors of this. Um, and what state was introduced or what, what restriction uh, was introduced varied depending upon what was in place in that state and what the political climate looked like. Um, the problem was made worse because uh, in 2013, we had a Supreme Court decision called Shelby County versus Holder, which enfeebled what had been the strongest uh, civil rights statute of our day, um, the Voting Rights Act. It, uh, it effectively mothballed a particular provision that took those jurisdictions that had the greatest history of racial discrimination in voting um, and said that those jurisdictions no longer had to demonstrate in advance that any election change they were trying to make uh, didn't 
make minority voters worse off or was not designed to try and make minority voters worse off. So you had more restrictive legislation and, and policies coming from the state, fewer federal protections, and voters caught in the crossfire. Um, where we are now is that Congress has still not restored the Voting Rights Act, even though the House voted to pass it. Um, and we still are seeing uh, two Americas in this, in, this, in this country for the most part. We see states that um, seem to be trying really hard to adopt a lot of pro-voter policies with varying levels of success. And then we have states where there are large pockets of resistance where they have compounding barriers being put in front of the ballot box. I'm from Texas. And I would say that Texas is one of those states where at every part in the pipeline, there's, it's harder to vote than what other states are harder to participate, harder to vote, harder to register, you name it, it's harder than what it is in other countries or in other, in other states. And so I think one of the things that we need to ask ourselves is how many barriers do we wanna put in front of the ballot box and what are we getting from doing that? Like what sort of restrictions need to be put in place that strike an appropriate balance between making sure that we have access and making sure that there are no cheaters. Um, and my position is that we often don't get it right, that we often put more barriers in front of the ballot box than what we need to, to get the return on how much um, suppression or disenfranchisement that we're causing. But one of the nice things about having young people who are in the, in the midst of uh, uh, very powerful institutions is that you guys will be weighing in on the stuff too. And you guys will be looking at the data and looking at the research and trying to actually weigh, you know, how many people are stopped or blocked from voting or have that being harder versus how many people are trying to cheat and does what we're trying to do here actually stop the cheaters or does it just put barriers somewhere else? And I think unfortunately too much, um, in too many instances, we don't have people looking at the data, looking at the research, trying to find solutions. People are retreating to their particular political corner and speaking sound bites. And my hope is that the next generation of policymakers um, do better than that, do better than where we've been in the last 10 years on that. Mitter, can I just um, add to that? Um, one issue that's particularly relevant to uh, Florida is in and relevant to who can vote uh, is, is the question of whether felons uh, are, are allowed to vote. Can you just give us a little bit of background to, to that issue and, and, and how that's playing out, particularly um, in the, the um, sort of uh, current uh, climate with the Black Lives Matters protests, given the, the disparities of, of who actually uh, gets incarcerated in the United States? Sure, happy to do so. Um, I, I'm assuming since most of you are Florida uh, and are politically involved uh, and aware, you know that up until 2018, Florida had among the most restrictive law in the country for getting your right to vote uh, back if you have a felony conviction. And when I say among the worst is that at the time, it was one of two um, that had this policy of permanent disenfranchisement. Um, the Brennan Center and a whole bunch of other people, including extraordinarily talented and uh, folks who are impacted uh, from Florida, led a historic campaign to put on the ballot Amendment 4, which uh, passed with an overwhelming uh, margin and was the most popular thing on the ballot. Amendment 4 got more support than any other statewide candidate. Um, and not too long after that victory, um, the Florida legislature uh, took it upon itself to make, to use its authority and its power to make it as hard as possible for the folks that the Constitution had reenfranchised to get back on. And I think one of the things that people miss is that the legislature could have taken a different tack. Um, there, the, the amendment four still requires people to have paid off their probation, or to be done with probation, to be done with parole. Um, the legislature could have reduced probation. They could have reduced the amount of parole statutorily. They could have said that there were fewer people that qualified for probation, but they didn't. What they did do was 
uh, try to codify as a matter of law that if people owned any sort of legal financial obligation, which could include fines or fees or costs or victim restitution, um, that that was going to be a barrier getting your rights to vote restored. So the Brennan Center and a whole bunch of other really good groups like the ACLU and the Legal Defense Fund uh, representing the League of Women Voters um, and a bunch of uh, the NAACP sued the legislation, not Amendment 4. And we've been bouncing through the courts. We've got a preliminary injunction, we've got a trial court ruling, um, the third, uh, the 11th Circuit upheld um, RPI, the 11th Circuit en banc just recently stayed this for a full hearing on the merits. So this is playing out in the court system. And one of the things that I would tell you Florida voters is do you want the courts deciding this or do you guys want to be deciding this? Like one of the things that has always surprised me is why are not more people putting pressure on their legislators for doing something that flew in the face of what 65% of voters voted for in Florida, voters of all political stripes. Um, so uh, that question is coming up. The like, what sort of role uh, does criminal justice um, play and what sort of connection is there appropriate to be making between the criminal justice system and our political participation? Um, what sort of uh, systemic and systematic racism within our criminal justice system then gets baked into our political process. Those are all things that I think are very, very live questions that it's going to be your generation's responsibility in resolving and fixing. Because um, we've moved pretty, pretty far in, in the years that I have been working on this. I'm very proud to say that more than a dozen states have made it easier for people with criminal convictions in their past to vote. Um, but we still have Iowa. We still have Florida, um, you know, Kentucky and Virginia could be changed with a change in governorship. Um, and uh, I think the, the public is really moving on this. The public is really sort of making the connections between um, what we know is wrong about our criminal justice system and then do we want to bake our political system on top of that. Thank you, that was fantastic. Um, Danielle, um, before we get on to talking about sort of careers and ways in which uh, um, the, the people participating in this webinar can, can get involved in sort of tackling some of these issues, um, one thing we haven't discussed is, is the role of the sort of federal government and particularly the, the FEC uh, where, where you used to work. Can you just tell us a little bit about uh, um, the role of um, you used to play and, and uh, others in the FEC play in, in the um, uh, oversight and uh, management of, of government, uh, sorry, of elections. Sure, so uh, the FEC is the Federal Election Commission and their name is a little bit uh, confusing and inaccurate because they mainly do campaign finance um, stuff. So they basically make sure that um, our campaign finance laws are being followed. And I say usually because for um, particularly the last, uh, six to eight months, there's basically been, in, we've been in and out of what's called a quorum. So the FEC was created um, to be bipartisan. And in order to um, basically make binding decisions, it needs at least four people, um, or it needs at least four commissioners to uh, vote for something. So basically, even if you see a campaign that you think is doing something illegal, and you send in a complaint, in order to hear the complaint um, and to even just investigate it, you need four commissioners to vote in favor. Um, what has happened very in the last um, few months is there hasn't even been a quorum. So there hasn't even been the eight commissioners um, that are usually supposed to be there. There had been three, um, which is a little crazy seeing as it is really the only organization um, or commission that is tasked with um, enforcing our campaign finance laws. And so we had a quorum for the first time in hundreds of days. Um, I can't remember the exact amount of time. And now uh, in about 28 days, we will no longer have a quorum again because another commissioner has basically uh, left um, or announced that they will be leaving um, imminently. So 
Um, that's what the FEC does. Then there's also the Election Assistance Commission, um, and they are the ones who are tasked basically with um, providing funds to the states and localities in order to help them um, facilitate, you know, their elections. And so um, they're really the ones who gave out, you know, the 400 million from the CARES Act. And um, they basically, they just say they don't have any more money currently. Uh, they have their own issues with um, keeping uh, commissioners and staff, which I am a little less familiar with, but um, they're the ones who mainly deal with the election administration while the FEC deals mostly with the campaign finance stuff. And so uh, when I was there, I interned for the commissioner or a commissioner who was there named Ann Ravel. Um, who is no longer a commissioner. She's back in California where she's from. But um, as an intern, I basically, as I said, the FEC receives complaints. As the complaints come in, um, I would review them. The commissioners would have meetings um, pretty often. And basically, you would read the complaints. You would read the general counsel's report on the complaint, which basically says whether or not they think you should move forward with investigating or not. Um, and then basically make a suggestion to the commissioner whether or not they should actually, in fact, move forward um, with investigation, um, which is basically called reason to believe. Um, so you think that there's a chance that some wrongdoing may have occurred. Um, and that is a pretty good segue to, to, to ask you to transition uh, slightly to uh, giving some advice to, to some of the people we have. Uh, on this webinar who are interested in getting involved in some of these issues uh, and uh, are looking for guidance on, on how they might do that. So based on your experience, Danielle, um, what, what, what advice do you, uh, do you have to offer for anyone who is um, captured by these issues and would like to contribute themselves? Sure, I mean, uh, the first thing I would say is you're probably doing it just by being here, I think. Um, engaging and starting to read and listen and learn and understand um, what is going on in the world around you. I know for me, I was born and raised in South Florida. Um, I was just barely kind of aware of what was going on in the 2000 election. Um, and, but it was, you know, Broward County is my county and there was plenty of issues with the hanging chads and whatnot um, going on there. And um, as I got older, I had to wait, you know, hours in line for or even early voting. Um, and that was kind of my jumping off point. And I think for me, it was talking to my professors, um, you know, kind of reading different books. Um, and then my suggestion for students now would be continuing that education, but also trying to find internships. Um, oftentimes I know um, it could be co cost prohibitive to, you know, spend a semester in DC, but just a lot of, I mean, all congressional um, offices have district offices working there, I think is a great entry point. Um, there are a surprising amount of nonprofits um, that are working on the ground now, particularly in Florida, who do this kind of thing. Um, even just trying to set up coffee or, you know, emailing someone and saying, hey, like, I think I'm interested in this, um, I think is a great first step. Um, and I think just, you know, getting out there, I took the straight from undergrad to law school route, and I would actually suggest if you are interested in this stuff and policy, don't do that and um, get some kind of on the ground experience and see what you can learn from that because that might be enough to kind of choose um, maybe a different route perspective. Thank you, that's fantastic advice. I'm gonna ask Eric in a moment just to give a little bit of uh, insight into the opportunities in DC for FIU students. But before that, Mida, can you just tell us a little bit more, uh, well, general advice would be fantastic, but also specifically um, what the um, Brennan Center is looking for in terms of interns and, and other people to come and join your work. Okay, I, uh, I, I talked to a lot of students and I'm an adjunct career counselor at Columbia Law School because I really feel like part of my job is to make sure that the next generation of civil rights lawyers feel very supported at a very early age. So I tend to give some pretty generic but consistent advice. Um, one is get as good of grades as you can. We can spend a lot of time talking about whether or not it's an accurate or inaccurate reflection about what you're capable of doing and um, 
you know, whether or not there should be the kind of emphasis that's on it, but the truth of the matter is your life is easier if you get better grades. Um, it just is. So do your best to make sure that you're focusing on your studies and that you're, um, that you're doing what you can to make them reflect what your capacity is. Uh, number two is be very, very smart about the debt that you are creating um, for yourself when you're in college, when you're in grad school. That debt is real. Um, having a lot of it is going to make, uh, you have to make choices about what jobs you can take, what jobs you can turn down, when you can uh, live, and be very mindful about what you're getting yourself into and that you own it. Um, the third thing is, is do you, like make, don't, uh, you know, I'm a civil rights lawyer. I've been in the public interest for the entirety of my career, but um, that's a choice that I've made because I don't have to support my parents right now, right? And I'm the breadwinner for my family. And I, up until last year, I lived in a rented home, even though I'm really old and I don't go on fancy vacations. My kid goes to a Title I public school, but I have a career that I like. Um, I've never had to take a job because of money, because of things that I've given up. Um, and if you uh, make whatever choice works for you and your family, be comfortable with it and know that there are lots and lots of paths to getting um, to the field of public service, to the field of public interest, and be creative about how you are going to do that um, if finances or other choices that you are making. But the main thing to do is like to be active and intentional about it. Do not let things happen to you. You are an agent. Uh, you are a, a person with autonomy. You are an actor in your life. And to make sure that the choices that you're making are stuff that you know um, has consequences and that you're comfortable with those consequences because you've looked at what's out there and decided that that's what's best for you. Uh, there's nothing that frustrates me more is when people treat themselves as things that people happen to. Like, yes, the world happens to you, but you're going to do much better in this world if you decide that you're going you're gonna to go swinging and that you're going to make it, it hard for the universe to put you in a particular box, right? So be very proactive and very intentional about the choices that you're making. With respect to the Brennan Center, um, we have term time internships for undergrad interns. One really nice thing about us is we're one of the few places in New York that actually pay our undergrad interns. We do that as a matter of policy. Um, we uh, also have summer uh, uh, undergrad uh, internships available that again, we do pay. And then we take graduates out of college called research and program associates. It is highly, highly, highly competitive. We will get thousands and thousands and thousands of applications for one slot. Um, but the kind of thing we're looking for are people who um, are good readers, writers, thinkers, and capable of, of people working with uh, other people. I myself tend to look for people that have been in sales because I know that that means you have talked to people. I like people that have had minimum wage jobs because I cannot be working till two in the morning and then have some 22 year old get upset because I asked them to make some copies for me or like, you know, make my airline reservations. Like, uh, you know, we, we need people who understand that this is like a team effort and that we all have a role to play and that a role from someone who just got out of college is gonna look different than someone who's been practicing law for 20 years. But our research and program associates do really important work um, sometimes they lobby for us, sometimes they write for us, sometimes they do draft writing, sometimes there are paralegals. And so I would, I would check it out. Um, you know, we're, we're always looking for good talent. We hire a crop of people every year. So, you know, we'll take between three and six people across the organization that just graduated from college. Um, so it's something that is available, I think, as folks are looking about their options. We have an excellent rate of putting, of getting people into the top law schools. Um, so uh, it's a really good experience. Thank you very much. Um, and that was fantastic advice from, from both of you. Um, I think I'm right, and Eric will tell me if I'm wrong, that we have, we have one uh, question at the moment on the, the chat. And uh, on the basis that I think people who, who ask questions ought to be encouraged and rewarded, uh, I'm going to ask Keith Alfaro to um, uh, ask his question. Keith, would you like yes, to, um, to ask your question? Yes, this is related to the thing that actually we're talking about. Um, 
I'm doing a small writing about, you, you know, a case that actually put this Merrill bill versus P the people first of Alabama. The Supreme Court actually said, you know, any changes at the, at the latest stages of the, of, of the election are not permitted. So what, you know, I, I know this is a, the COVID thing is a, com it's a completely wrench to everything that actually we've been doing for 230 years. Uh, what can we do about it? Because we cannot change the rules, but, at, but also at the same time, uh, we have a, a very particular situation. Also, all the stuff that actually you guys were mentioning, security, uh, fraudulent uh, mailing ballots and stuff like that will, will, will come in and will cause, um, you know, fraud in the system. So Thanks. how can we stop that? Thank you. Thanks, Sorry Steve. for uh, Midder, I guess that one probably is. is sure. So, um, Keith, it actually started way before this case. There's a decision, a Supreme Court decision called Purcell, which basically says that it is disfavored to make uh, election changes too close to the election. Yes, that was 2006. Yeah, the, the theory behind that, for those of you that don't spend your time reading Supreme Court cases, is that there is also a disenfranchising effect from changing the rules at the last minute of the game. So when you're in my business, you're constantly trying to race the clock and trying to make as many changes as you can, as early as you can, because you do not want to run up against what we call Purcell. Um, the, the, the Alabama case was a case brought by the Southern Poverty Law Center um, that uh, was trying to challenge a few specific restrictions that they had in Alabama. And they had won at the district court level. Um, there was a uh, motion for stay, which means to not uh, to not enact the preliminary injunction, which in that case was stopping these bad laws, um, uh, that went to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court at that point said, you know what, we're not going to stop those laws. So it's not the end of it. Like the, the court could go back and when it goes through a different process at a different point in time, the plaintiffs could have the opportunity to try and demonstrate that these laws are out of touch or unconstitutional or inappropriate. Um, but what I do think the big lesson, there, there are three big lessons. One, file your lawsuits as early as you can because um, the closer you get to an election, the harder you're gonna get um, to be able to make a, a change. Two, make sure that you are not putting all of your hopes in one basket of the court. Um, there's lots of ways to enact change. Um, in addition to the court, we've also got the legislature, we've got people power, we've got initiatives and referendums in certain states. So to be looking at that. And then three, ask yourself when you're bringing lawsuits, is this the judicial environment that you wanna bring them in? And are you likely to get a result that is uh, going to change the jurisprudence for one in which you think will closer live up to our ideals as a country and our founding documents? Or is it one that is going to take a, you know, set us back and one that's gonna make it harder for people like me to try and pass other laws in the future? Um, thank you. Uh, we're running up against our, our uh, three o'clock limit, uh, but we do have one more question. I think it is important question. So I'm, I'm, I'm Gonna, I'm going to ask it myself. It's from Alex Anaki, um, and it, it comes uh, revolves around this very important issue that uh, the 2020 election is important for at least one other reason, and that is that 2020 is a census year, and as a result, those people, not just uh, at the federal level, but people all down the ballot, are going to have uh, an impact on uh, how um, the uh, the geography of elections works over the next decade and uh, redistricting could have a, a significant impact on who gets elected uh, through the uh, 2020s and into the 2030s. Um, so um, I, if, if I could combine that sort of question with saying, you know, what implication do we think this has for, for, for democracy uh, in the US and, and particularly how the 2020 election might affect that with also asking uh, both Danielle and Meda to, to give some final thoughts before we uh, hand it back to, to Eric to, to sum up. So um, any thoughts on sort of the, the, the census and the, the 2020 election, Danielle, and final thoughts, and then we'll go to Meda and then, then to Eric. Sure. Um, I think it's incredibly important. I think down ballot races are oftentimes ignored. Um, 
this happened, you know, in 2010, in 2010, where um, you had kind of dismal turnout, and we are seeing the results and kind of dealing with that to this day, 10 years later, um, I think this is a real opportunity to kind of really think about who the state legislature or legislators are going to be and um, how are they are going to basically receive uh, the data and how they're going to interpret it. Um, there's a lot of other questions with the census, which, um, you know, is happening now. So if you haven't pulled out your census, you should. But um, basically what it does is it gives them an opportunity uh, to draw districts most favorable to them or maybe get rid of gerrymandering in their state. Um, you have certainly seen in the last few years a big increase of states trying to um, basically create independent redistricting commissions and panels in order to kind of stop another way of disenfranchising voters um, or at least watering down voices. Um, so that's very important. You should definitely pay attention and really do your research into your state um, legislators and other down ballot races to see um, in a lot of places that includes judges who also will have a big impact um, on these kinds of questions. Um, and final words, I think if this is something that you're really interested in, um, I'm happy to chat. Also, I um, will put in the chat, I guess my email, um, if anyone would like to talk, I think if you um, are interested or able, you should certainly try to talk to your members of Congress, um, particularly in Florida, about seeing, um, about getting more funding in your, um, for our elections in 2020, it's incredibly important. And um, I think I will end it there. Uh, and I would just say, I, I'm a civil rights lawyer and I'm grown. And so part of those two things <laughs> mean that I engage in the magical thinking that if we work long enough and hard enough, um, we can bend the moral arc of the universe closer to justice. And I think we need uh, folks who are willing to put their shoulder into it. We, um, we're at a real moment of reckoning, I think, for this country where we are looking at some serious cracks and some serious flaws and trying to decide what are we gonna do about them? Are we gonna to continue to paper over them? Are we gonna try and address them? Are we gonna try and resolve them? Are we at peace with them? And uh, I hope that as young people with a lot of promise and potential in front of you, um, that you decide to be part of the solution, that you look around and figure out um, which ways you can make your community better, which ways you can make your country better, because there is so much work that needs to be done and a million and a half ways to participate and contribute. Um, and the country needs you right now. We really, really do. We need all of our talents and expertise and experience um, to get us out of a challenge that is a very long time in the making. Thank you. That's a fantastic way to end. Um, so let me just quickly say thank you to Danielle Caputo and uh, Mirda Perez and uh, hand you back now to Eric, uh, who I notice has uh, already put uh, a load of links into the chat, uh, as has Danielle put her email address. So I recommend you check that out. But uh, Eric, back to you. Thanks, Ian. And I echo your thinking of our two panelists for all of their insights, information, and encouragements to get involved in both a volunteer and a, and a career capacity. Uh, and I also thank both of them for putting their email addresses into the chat to further connect with the 50 uh, students and others who are, are joining us today. And I also, of course, want to thank you, uh, Ian, for taking your time to, to moderate this discussion. So I know you brought up how, how what opportunities are in DC for uh, uh, FIU students and so I, you know I kind of covered in the beginning and reiterated here how to get in touch with me and how to uh, get on our, our talent lab website and I also to echo uh, the point of getting to know your local and state legislatures and, uh, uh, and elected officials. I have live in Fairfax County, Virginia now myself and have been on a recent odyssey since being at home uh, more often to, to figure out who all the people who represent me here are and have done that and have been writing and, and figuring out election uh, dates for each individual and monitoring how they're responding to many things in the current environment on Twitter and in their email newsletters. And it's been a very informative and interesting uh, process of democracy. So I look forward to that happening in Miami and wherever else our group is joining us from.
thank you all so much for joining us. And again, to, uh, to Mirna and Danielle and, and Ian for, for spending their hour with us. Thank you. For Thank you. I think so.